So what got you, I'm just curious, like, what got you interested in De Deuteronomy? Why did it stick out to you um, and why you eventually wrote your dissertation on to, in it? Uh, there are a number of things. I think I think the initial thing was was how, because it's a sermon and um, it, it, it sort of, it speaks into the heart more obviously than, say, Leviticus and Numbers, which I've also now preached and taught and uh, and so on as well. But uh, Deuteronomy, I think, um, does that more explicitly. And I think uh, one of the areas I've sort of done a little bit of work on and a couple of my students who are supervised have worked on more than I have is in the rhetoric of the book of Deuteronomy. So I think, I think the rhetoric uh, engages us. I mean, it's not quite mm. the sort of rhetoric of you know, Martin Luther King or um, or whatever, but um, but it's still more captivating language. But then I think um, I think in the end, uh, the, the, what what's kept me going with the Book of Deuteronomy? It, well, firstly, it's diversity. There's laws and narrative, a great mix of things, all embedded as a sermon. But it's also, I think, one of the the linchpin passages for connecting Old and New Testaments together. And uh, I think too many Christians have a view that the Old Testament is sort of legalistic and the New Testament's about faith and grace, but um, which I think is a, a fundamentally wrong view. Mm. But, um, but Deuteronomy, I think, puts it together in a, in a compelling way um, as it looks forward to the New Testament, to an ultimate work of grace. And um, so my PhD thesis was on well, it's published as the as the triumph of grace in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. I mean, and um, but it's it's really an an investigation into the nature of sin and grace uh, in Deuteronomy. And what I think we find is uh, so consistent into the New Testament as well. So uh, Israel has failed in the past. Two times in particular are recounted in Deuteronomy. So in chapters one to three, it's the spies incident from Numbers 13 and 14. When Israel sends spies into the land, they come back and report the enemy are great and fortified. We don't think we should go here. We're scared. Let's you know avoid the land. And the people chicken out, basically. And they're, they're, they're condemned then, really, to a generation in the wilderness for the children to inherit the land. Hmm. And uh, But what the, the nature there of their sin, but the grace that keeps going, because God could have just abandoned them and started again with another group of people. But he didn't. And then in chapter 9, uh, Deuteronomy recounts the golden calf incident from Exodus 32 to 34, abbreviated form. But the same thing, a sin that is fundamentally significant and yet an act of grace to keep going. It's in response to Moses' prayer of intercession at the end of Deuteronomy 9. But um, why does God show such grace? And then the third time in Deuteronomy is, is a forward-looking so Moses in Deuteronomy 29 looks forward or anticipates the failure of Israel to come in the land in the future, but an ultimate work of grace that will restore the people to the land from exile and change their hearts in Deuteronomy 30. The two chapters go together. And so twice in the past, once looking into the future, but the same premise, that is God's anger, wrath, motivated by deep sin, really, uh, in each case, but then an act of grace, an act of grace that's founded, I think, on the Abrahamic promises. So God's faithfulness mm. to them is critical in understanding grace in the Old Testament, but a grace in uh, ultimately that will change the hearts. And that I think um, uh, that that's one of my favorite passages, I think, in Scripture is this uh, chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. And... Um, and, and at the center point of it is that uh, I will I will circumcise your hearts and you will love God and obey God. And that, I think, is what the Old Testament looks forward to uh, all the way into the New Testament. It uses different language at times to look forward. So Jeremiah 31, the New Covenant passage, writing the law on the heart, is the same idea, slightly different language. Ezekiel 36 speaks of the heart of stone becoming a heart of flesh. Same idea again, but slightly different language. Um uh, looking forward to something internal happening. And that's what, what the cross does. So the cross doesn't merely forgive, uh, but provides the circumcision of the heart. The language is used in Romans 2 and Colossians 2 as well.